right, so it's 12 noon in Accra and also about 2 p.m. in Cairo. My name is Solis Rose Quarter. Welcome to Midday Live on TV3. Don't forget that we're always live on DSTV Channel 279. Let me take you through the headlines for this afternoon. Now, President Akufuado issues an executive notice officially renaming the seat of government, Jubilee House, from Flagstaff House. And Ghana Navy steps up surveillance and investigations to find five sailors being held hostage by pirates who hijacked a fishing vessel in Ghana's territorial waters. And on the foreign front, a Kenyan opposition figure Meguna Meguna says he was beaten and drugged before being forcibly removed from the country for the second time. All these are more coming up in the next 60 minutes, um, as well as sports and entertainment. Well, let, let's start off with what broke this morning. That's the news coming in. And the fact that the name of the seat of government has been changed from the Flagstaff House to Jubilee House. Workers on Thursday morning replaced the old signage of Flagstaff House with Jubilee House. The name for the seat of government has been in contention for some time now. The new patriotic party, the MPP, during whose administration the facility was constructed, advocated Jubilee House, while the National Democratic Congress, the NDC, preferred Flagstaff House as named during the First Republic. And news just coming in. The Deputy General Secretary of the National Democratic Congress, the NDC, Koku Anidoho, has been granted bill. We'll be giving you details on the happenings of this particular story. But as you well know, he was picked up on Wednesday, uh, on the 27th of March, for allegedly saying things that amounted to um, treason. So we'll bring you more on this particular breaking news and while the bulletin um, continues. And let's do some other stories now. And President Akufuado subsequently um, issued an executive order stating the reasons that there's no record evidence in the renaming of a seat of the presidency as the Flagstaff House by His Excellency Professor John Evans at Mills. Now, let me try and uh, take you through some of the key areas. Now, one of the things that ensue is the fact that, um, the, for instance, when this broke in the morning, the PNC, um, the PNC's Bernard Mona was saying that um, the, the, the renaming is needless. Some few people have also come out with that particular one. All right, so now what we do know for sure is that the Flagstaff House is no more. What we do know now is that it is now called the Jubilee House. Now, political historian Professor Nana Asil Fikundua has described as unnecessary the name change of the seat of government, and then basically he's not the first person to say so. Now, he's of the conviction that another government in the future will change it, um, which he says is not good for the country's democracy. Today, there has been a name change of the seat of government from Flagstaff House to Jubilee House. Well, this is not something new, some people may argue, because since the president took office, um, he has been talking about this name change, and today it has happened. Now, I have with me um, Nana, Professor Nana Isilfi Kudria, who is a political historian, to pick his thoughts on this particular matter. Good afternoon, Nana. Good afternoon. This name change, is it necessary at all? It's one of the most unnecessary things, particularly at this moment in our country and all the things that are going on. 
uh, name change per se, right, on its own, is something that is done. But where it concerns a history, and a, a very huge history at that, it necessarily will require some kind of ceremony. From the accounts that are given me, it's subject to correction, and I'm prepared for that correction. It would seem like it, it, there was something that is not really healthy about how it was done. That come this morning, it was found that the, the slabs on the walls had been replaced with from Flagstaff House to Jubilee House. It's not the first time that, yes, the president has talked about it. And I've also, it's not the first time I'm also going to comment on it. I've commented and said that it's unnecessary. And indeed, I've gone to the extent of writing to recommend a way out, i.e. that call it Jubilee House in Flagstaff House, or call it Jubilee Palace in Flagstaff House. That, I think, would have sufficed and satisfied to calm down the political protest. This is bound to raise. It has gone to a crescendo before. Um, if you think about it, that you have to keep your history. And if you are in the habit of removing or obliterating all your historical landmarks, you stand to be told that your country does not exist. Because a country that has no history does not exist. Secondly, uh, cynically, politically, one will be tempted then to say that it was done stealthily as a political diversionary tactic. Because we have a crisis, I'm referring to the Anidaho, Anidaho crisis, and um, perhaps some strategists who for me, looking at it head to toe now, would force me reluctantly as a matter of fact to say that perhaps this strategy is, is, uh, is a neophyte. It wasn't done so. That was not a sudden thing that you wake up in the morning and you find, a, hey, there's this change noticeable. So, Nana, are you in any way suggesting that the president or government should have notified the people of Ghana before making the change? Yes, there's something. If you, if you find there's nothing wrong with what you are doing as a government, the people must be informed. The government knows, is aware that the country is divided opinion-wise on this matter. It's just a matter of a simple news statement that while well, the government is grateful for the public concerns, but has taken all the necessary advices and uh, thinks that in this age, at this time, the title change is worth it. You understand? And that would have come nerves or protest. But you haven't done that. That means that having done it, quote, perhaps secretly, means that you know that there's something that matter wrong with what you're doing. And indeed, innately, you think that you are doing wrong. But for some reason unknown, you have done that and presenting it as a fait accompli. What happens future, I dare to speculate, is that we will go back to it. Another government will in this country. So what happens to this country that here is a country which goes forward one step and comes back two steps all the time. So it's a circus. Now, now, will you then suggest that um, a policy be put in place to prevent our politicians from changing names of um, government institutions? Uh, that is like uh, prescribing a uniform for politicians. And um, we always think that this is not necessary, that everything that we do, mind you, you are in a democracy. And if this is going to be the pattern, well, there's a new democracy for you in Ghana. Superb, fine. I don't know the cost of it, but I'm saying that whatever you spent on this, which is going to be wholly unnecessary, it is now, and it is going to be, that money you must have spent, couldn't it have gone? to give us a healthier, and indeed Flagstaff House, a healthy environment because you border on NIMA. And NIMA has that problem of sanitation. All that, that's what I'm advocating.
So we have been speaking to Professor Nana Esifi Kodua, who is a political historian. I'm Evelyn Tengma, TV3 News. Now let's turn our attentions back to the breaking news that we just received, the fact that the Deputy General Secretary of the NDC, Koku Anidoho, has been granted bail. Now my colleague Richard Bright Addo has been nosing around the BNI head office and uh, he just joins us on the phone. Good afternoon, Bright. Many thanks for joining us. Now, Richard Bright, Addo, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Um, so you've been at the BNI for quite some time, and we've received information that uh, um, uh, Kokwani Joho has been granted bill. Can you confirm this? Yes. Um, um, Solid. Um, let me say that, well, I got to the BNI uh, uh, office here uh, 30 minutes ago, and uh, I spotted uh, quite a few of uh, the party supporters here. Uh, we have some few people here, um, lawyer Eduji, uh, the former um, health minister, Alessa Bethia. We have uh, lawyer Dividanan also here, and then one other lawyer, Adawuga. Um, and then the father of um, Mr. Koku Anudohu is also, is also here, as well as the MP, Honorable Benjamin Kodo, who is the MP for whole Central. They are all here. Unfortunately, when they got here, they said that two of the lawyers can only go in, and so lawyer Anand is also here. I would like to find out from him so that he can confirm to us whether um, uh, Mr. Koku Anidoho has been granted bill or not. Okay, Hello. go ahead. Lawyer David Anand, this is TV3. Yes, this is TV3. You are live on TV3. Can you tell us, can you confirm um, whether uh, Mr. Koku Anidoho has been granted bill or not? Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to hold that for now, but I'm very confident, I'm quite confident that uh, that he will be granted bail. Um, as one of the lawyers for his process, this is what uh, should happen, but we, we, we just have to wait and see that the release is done. So that's all I'm going to say for now. Thank you. Hmm. All right. So, Solid, uh, that was uh, lawyer David Annan, uh, who is also here together with some of the uh, top lawyers for uh, Mr. Koku and um, hoping that the uh, the man would be granted bill or, in fact, as you said him, he said he's been granted bill, but they are hoping that he will be released, and that's when they can confirm that indeed. And so uh, his father is here, who, who is one of the people to sign the, yeah, the sureties, who is one of the sureties, the father and one lawyer, one other lawyer will have to grant the sureties okay. so that he, he will be released. Thank you very much. All right, so Richard Brightado is our correspondent on the grounds at uh, the BNI, and uh, he's b he'll be bringing us more information as to exactly when we can confirm for sure that the Deputy General Secretary of the NDC, Koko Anidoho, will be released or has been released. Now, let's still stick around this same story, but uh, related ones. And the multimedia journalist, Latif Idris, who was assaulted on Monday by the police, has lodged an official complaint at the cantonment's Police station. Consequently, the Director General of the Police Public Affairs, ACP David Eklu, says the police will take up the matter and make the necessary correction, but said the journalist in question would help in investigations by identifying the police officer who manhandled him. I haven't spoken to the journalist yet, but as I speak now, he has gone to lodge a formal complaint at the Cantonment's police station. Uh, over the incident. Uh, we are also looking at what happened because uh, the event started, the police um, managed the event very well because the crowd we see the frontage of the CID headquarters for about three, four hours and uh, there wasn't any uh, use of force until this incident happened. So we need to find out what happened. We need to hear from the journalist and uh, find out who actually did that. We do not encourage assaults on journalists performing their official duties. If you can help us identify the police officer involved, it will be very useful. Certainly, he has lodged a complaint, so he would, he would help us. Now, still related to this particular issue, the Director General of uh, the Police Public Affairs, ACP, David Eklu, also spoke to us on whether the police acted professionally by firing rubber bullets into protesters that we deployed at the entrance of the CID headquarters, exercise maximum restraint. 
For hours, they had even blocked the ring road, the main road, but they had to be persuaded. Senior officers went there to make sure that they do not cause unnecessary traffic jam, unnecessary chaos. So we, the, the fire, the use of the, uh, the water cannon and then the, uh, the rubber bullet was at the latter stage in the evening when darkness was setting in. Other people were taking advantage of the situation to cause mayhem. So the police had to increase the level of force to make sure that the place is cleared. Otherwise, from 2 o'clock when the crowd started milling up in front of the CID headquarters, up to 6.30 or so, nothing happened. But when it started getting to 7 o'clock, when it started getting darker, we saw a lot of other people jumping in to take advantage of the situation to cause mayhem in front of the police headquarters and then also block the main ring road, which was unacceptable. So the police had to increase the level of force to make sure that the crowd was dispersed. Now, still not related to this issue, former President Jerry John Rawlins has called for cool heads and the rule of law to prevail in the matter of Koku Anidoho's arrest for treason, describing the whole saga as a media political circus. In a tweet, Jerry John Rawlins said the investigative processes must be adhered to without recourse to emotions. All right, now to some news that we heard of since last night. The Ghana Navy has stepped up surveillance and investigations to find the five sailors who have been held hostage by pirates who hijacked a fishing vessel on the territorial waters of Ghana. Now, the five include uh, three Korean nationals, one Ghanaian and a Greek national as well. Now... We're going to be sticking with this particular issue regarding the hijacking of the vessel on and Ghana's territorial waters. And I have been joined in studio by Naval Captain Dr. Kamal Dean Ali. He's Executive Director at the Center for Maritime Law and Security Africa. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us yeah, on Midday Live. Yeah, good afternoon, Solis. Right. So now, historically, we've heard a lot about um, piracy issues on, in the eastern part of Africa. But what do you think has contributed to this now in our Western um, Africa? Okay, let me indicate also that, yes, um, historically we heard of piracy incidents in the East Coast of Africa, um, f especially from the year 2000 to about 2006, 2007. Mm -hmm. um, but also in the West Coast of Africa, we've been dealing with a decade old or more than a decade old piracy situation. Mm -hmm. So it means that um, this is also something that is um, very topical and something that should be worrying mm. to um, us as a country, yeah. um, the region as a whole, and the international community. Mm. Um, uh, piracy is a crime, and there are certain um, motivations that uh, underpin every crime. Um, for that matter, we have a number of um, issues, uh, but Typically, in the case of the West Coast of Africa, um, most of the high-profile piracy incidents are conducted from um, ex-Niger Delta militants um, in Nigeria. Mm. Um, if you went back to the history of the Niger Delta militancy, um, uh, what we call the movement for emancipation of Niger Delta, and the fact that that particular group disbanded in quotes um, in, a, in and about 2012, um, they stopped officially um, the war on land, which concurrently they conducted along the creeks and maritime yeah, coastal areas. Mm. So these militants have largely turned themselves into a, a piracy enterprise. Now, for, we, we've heard of how the you know, international interference has helped with what we, we, we've been experiencing on the eastern coast. However, wh what do you think has contributed to pirates targeting the west coast? Yes, in the East Coast, of course, it was a clear case of UN Security Council mm -hmm. deciding that the international community will have to physically intervene. So it's much like de uh, deciding that there should be a peacekeeping force or mm -hmm. any form of intervention in any country within the mandate of the UN Security Council. Mm -hmm. In the case of we, uh, West Africa, um, because govern, uh, go uh, we have sovereign states that are stable, 
as compared to Somalia in 2006, where we didn't have a government, you cannot have a comparative UN Security Council resolution ordering the presence of foreign presence in our, in our waters. Okay. So what it means is that the countries in the region will have to deal with the issue. And they deal with that issue within their own strength, but also within the weaknesses that exist in their law enforcement capability. Now, let's talk about the nationalities of these pirates. How has it, the trend been? The trend has been that um, we've been having uh, a lot of long-range um, piracies um, uh, conducted by uh, persons on board speedboats um, that will leave the coast of Nigeria, hand down vessels across the sub-region um, where such vessels are hijacked. The vessels are then taken back to, 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 to Nigeria. It depends exactly on what is happening. If um, ransom hijacking is the modus, uh, is the modus, the, 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 the intent, then um, the people are sent on land. If fuel siphoning is the intent, then the fuel is um, transferred at sea. Mm. This particular vessel, this is actually the second time it has been hijacked. This particular I, yes, one? Yes, I was okay. running through my records and I realized that it had been hijacked in 2004, is it 2005? Um, it was kept for a number of days and it was released. And what we are seeing here seems to suggest that we are having a ransom hijacking. Mm. The crew are taken and then you have to pay a ransom. ransom. It could be a million, a two million dollar for, for their release or any amount that is negotiated and accepted. So in terms of the pirates themselves, have we had a trend of a particular type of nationality fitting um, the bill? It, it always depends. Um, uh, depends. Um, you will have generally um, um, operatives from Niger Delta region, okay. which means Nigeria. Okay. But it's depending on the type of piracy you are looking at, you could also have other nationalities involved. Okay. Um, when it comes, for example, to uh, hijacking tankers for the transfer of oil, mm. uh, you could have uh, any number of nationalities that are good at that operation, especially at transferring oil at sea. Okay. Uh, so you could have a mixture of, of pirates. But the, the, the emphatic thing is that uh, one piracy incident means a lot when it comes to the economy uh, and when it comes to the safety and security of the region. Mm -hmm. Just imagine that as a country, we depend on the port for most of our, our, of our revenue. Yeah. And also remember that as a country, we are also increasingly now looking at the maritime domain for oil and gas. Yes. So any form of insecurity within our maritime domain is highly disruptive to our economy as much as it is a security so threat. So what can we do? What, what can you know, um, countries on the West Coast do to make sure that this, this menace is nipped in the bud? A number of factors. Um, surveillance is important, so you must continue to um, survey the maritime domain, uh, increase your maritime domain awareness, your awareness of what is happening, mm. um, your capability to deploy at sea and do that quickly and be able to um, interdict or intercept a, a piracy vessel. Uh, maritime operations are very expensive. So as countries, we must invest in that. We must invest in that. They are very expensive operations. So we need to invest in that and also address serious um, governance and legal deficits yeah. that we have in the whole spectrum of, of, of responding to maritime security. All right. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us on Midday Live. I've been speaking with Naval Captain Dr. Kamal Dean Ali. He's the Executive Director of the Center for Maritime Law and Security, Africa. You're still watching Midday Live. We'll be back with more news updates after this. Stay with us. It's now time for us to do some business news here on Midday Live. And Oxfam and the Africa Center for Energy Policy want government to address the issue of inequality in the country through fiscal policies and a harmonized national identification system. Now this, according to the civil society organizations, will bring about a fair and equitable redistribution of the country's natural resources. Income has become more unevenly distributed as 10% of the richest receive more than double the wealth of the poorest 40% in the country. Meanwhile, government spending on poor poor sectors has marginally declined. Spending in health declined from 11% of government budget in 2014 to 8% of the 2016 budget, resulting in spending per person of $32 compared to the global standard of $87. 
Fundamental to the widening inequality arising from the spending deficit is that revenue mobilization through taxation has been low and regressive. Ghana collects 55% of its tax revenue from indirect sources such as VAT, excise duties and customs which are a burden to some of the poor. A stakeholder engagement seminar organized by Oxfam and the Africa Center for Energy Policy called on government to address the issue of inequality through fiscal policies and a harmonized national identification system. There are taxable areas that the government has to look at, you see, and property uh, tax is one of it. It's very important. If you've been able to put up this big building, why can't you pay tax on it, you see? So that roads and others in this area, you can use this property tax to develop the areas give them water, give them good roads, sanitation issues and others. An IMF study reveals income equality increases a country's economic growth more than free trade. Now, the special advisor to the president on the sustainable development goals, Dr. Eugene Owusu, has said gender inequality is estimated to cost the nation 4% of gross domestic product annually. He noted the sustainable banking principles will lessen the gender gap, thereby helping to achieve some of the sustainable development goals. Addressing a stakeholder's forum on sustainable banking principles in Accra, the advisor to the president on the SDGs, Dr. Eugene Owusu, was of the view that Though the Sustainable Development Goals are ambitious, it represents the blueprint for future development. The goals are about people, they are about our planet, they are about prosperity, and importantly, they are about peace and partnerships. We need to have the political will to implement the goals. He assured participants that resources have been allocated towards achieving the SDGs. The goals require unprecedented efforts by all segments of society to achieve them. And for me, I think the key challenge is really to, for us to demonstrate unparalleled leadership in the implementation of the goals. Signing the agreement between the Bank of Ghana and the International Finance Corporation, the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank, L.C. Abaji, indicated a collaborative effort of BOG, Ghana Association of Bankers and the Environmental Protection Agency has resulted in the preparation of the Sustainable Banking Principles and Sector Guidance Note with seven general principles proposed. Principles for identifying, measuring and mitigating and monitoring environmental and social risks in banks' business activities, promoting gender equality, promoting financial inclusion, and finally, principles for reporting on compliance with these principles. Chairman of the Bank of Ghana Sustainable Banking Committee, Musa Sala, noted the Sustainable Development Goals has necessitated commercial banks to change the way they conduct business. When we're looking at people, we're looking at profit, and at the same time, we're looking at planet. Beside that one, too, you need to understand, if we are asking banks to make sure that they are risk portfolio quality is enhanced and with the measures on environment and social and governance. We're telling them that make sure that you will not lose any credit as a result of your client non-compliant with the environment and social regulations. The sustainable banking principles require banks to assess economic, environmental and social risk affecting the project and businesses they finance and ensure that appropriate measures are adopted to mitigate such risks. The producer price inflation for February 2018 was 5.5% as against January 7.7% representing a 2.2% decrease. The acting government statistician Ban Wadia indicated that the decline was as a result of the decrease in inflation rate in the manufacturing sector. The producer price inflation or index PPI measures the average change over in the prices received by domestic producers for the production of their goods and services. The month-on-month -month change in producer price index between January and February 2018 was 0.1%. For February, the mining and quarrying subsector producer price inflation stood at 9.1%, 
recording a decrease of 9.1% over January's 18.3%. The manufacturing subsector also recorded producer price inflation of 6.0%, a 1.3% departure from January figure of 7.3%. The utility subsector recorded 0.2%, indicating no change in inflation from January to February. Acting government statistician Ba Wadie explained the factors accounting for February's figures. The year-on-year -year inflation rates in X factory prices of goods and services was 5.5% in February 2018. That is, X factory prices of goods and services for all industry increased on average by 5.5% in February 2018, relative to the price level recorded in February 2017. The sector trends show a consistent decrease in the mining and quarrying sector. The manufacturing and utility sectors, however, saw increases in inflation in 2017, but took a steady decline between January and February 2018. For mining and quarrying, the producer inflation rate was 9.7% in February 2017. The rate then increased consistently to record 14.4% in November 2017. It increased again to 19.1% in December 2017, but it declined to 18.3% in January 2018 and then to 9.2% in February 2018. The producer price inflation serves as an indicator to predict consumer price inflation. It is useful in analyzing potential market prices. Decreases in the PPI inform decreases in the prices of goods and services acquired by consumers. Now let's take another look at uh, the issue regarding piracy in West Africa. And the Ghana Navy has stepped up surveillance and investigations to find the five sailors who have been held hostage by pirates who hijacked a fishing vessel on the territorial waters of Ghana. The five include three Korean nationals, one Ghanaian and a Greek national. The Ghanaian fishing vessel was on Monday hijacked by some unknown persons believed to be pirates. According to the owners of the vessel, World Maritime Company, the vessel was jacked at 5.20 p.m. Monday, March 26, while sailing the bait grounds. The pirates were alleged to have used a speedboat. The Ghana Navy was later informed only when another vessel had returned to the Tema port. The crew on board, according to the owners of the vessel, including three Korean expatriates, the captain, the chief officer and chief engineer, have been taken captive by assailants and their whereabouts unknown. According to the flag officer commanding the Eastern Naval Command, a team has been dispatched to hunt for these alleged pirates. For the past 48 hours, that is since a Monday dawn, we have had a series of attacks which are, we are trying to unravel, but our investigation now indicates that they are all very much connected. It all started uh, Monday dawn around about 03.30 when a speedboat came to uh, Tema Anchorage area and then uh, forcefully took over a vessel. They asked the vessel to weigh anchor and what, when that was done, they took over the vessel and then started heading east, that is to, towards the uh, Togolese border, moving a, a, a little bit uh, seaward. Then when the vessel complained that they were not having enough fuel to go ahead, uh, they abandoned the vessel, hijacked another one, carried uh, three personnel from that boat into the uh, new, newly hijacked uh, vessel and then also asked them to head towards uh, Bayelsa in Nigeria. So basically they were heading, taking these vessels to Bayelsa in Nigeria. The second vessel, which was also a uh, tanker, com also complained of fuel, that they were not having enough fuel to make the journey to Nigeria. And when the hijackers realized that, they went into another uh, uh, fishing vessel. 
Well, we'll be keeping tabs on this particular developing story as well and bringing you details as and when we get some. But that's how we end business news this afternoon on Midday Live. Let's move away from that and do some other stories or go back to the story regarding Koku Anidoho, the Deputy General Secretary of the NDC. Apparently, he's been finally released. My colleague Richard Bright Addo is currently at the BNI headquarters and joins us once again via phone. Bright? Hello, Sole. Yes. What can you tell us? Um, well, th th there's been some movement in and then out the we house. A couple of minutes ago, I personally support, uh, supported uh, Mr. Koku Anidoho. He was moved from the reception to the inner room of the BNI. And I understand that he has been uh, granted the bill, so he will be released shortly. And so uh, you could see that uh, some uh, vigorous movement outside the, uh, the BNI head office here. And uh, some few of the supporters, especially the executives, are being careful uh, releasing information to us, but they are optimistic that the man has been granted bill, and they are wrapping up with some few uh, paperwork so that uh, he'll be released in terms of the conditions and all that. Uh, we are hoping that once he's released, uh, we can ask uh, his lawyer and then the uncle or the, the father as well what the conditions were. So w maybe we should stand by and then hold on for some few uh, minutes. All right. Um, can you um, give us a brief um, view of how the atmosphere looks like? How, how do they look? Um, yes. You know what? I, I think that, yes, he, yes, he's been released. He's been released. The, the man has been released. Um, some of the uh, party supported, uh, some of the lawyers just stepped out and they started um, uh, hugging each other. I, I see some brass band are already coming in and uh, the, the gate to the BNI is wide open. They are hoping that uh, Mr. Goku and Ndoho, who is probably sitting in a car right now, will come out and then uh, he, will, he will probably, uh, well, we've been told that he, they will head straight to the head office from the BNI office here. They will, they will drive him straight to the head office uh, where he can address party supporters also. But I can say, yes, yes now I can see the Honorable Benjamin uh, Podo, the MP for Whole Central, uh, who, who has just come out. Honorable Adewudu, Adewudu has also come out and he is... Uh, he is uh, He's all looking cheerful and all that, an indication that, yes, indeed, the man, the man has been granted bill and he'll be released soon. Mr. Podo, this is TV3, please. Uh, this is TV3. Speak to us. Has uh, Mr. Koko and Yudoho been granted bill or released? Uh, he's been released. I can confirm that. Okay. And we are just about. All right, all right. So, Mr. Podo, uh, can we move to this side? Uh, tell me, uh, what were the conditions? Uh, that very, very happy, really happy. Okay. Sorry. All right. Okay. So, um, Solis, Solis, it's, it's quite chaotic in here uh, because the man has just been released, and uh, we are hoping that he will just sit in the car, and then when they drive him to the party headquarters, we will surely follow up and then uh, get get viewers some more updates. Okay, thank you very much, Richard Bright Addo, who was speaking to us live from the BNI headquarters. And it is official, um, Koko Anidoho, the Deputy General Secretary for the NDC, has been released. We'll get more information about what happens after that. But now it's time for our MTN video report, where Richard Anani sent this video from Bechem in the Bunua Hafu region. Now he reports on some abandoned dustbins for almost a year near the insurance office. Live from Britain. This, uh, just want to take a view, a look at this dustbin. It had been here for almost quite a long time, a year, and nothing seems to be have done about it. Like, there seem to be no ties for this dustbin. Quite a number of them, them say plenty of them, which has been lying for quite like a year since I saw it. So, I just wanted to report this whose duty this to just make these corrections and to make them put to work and the use. So, reporting live from wherever. Is it the thoughts of the Zoom Lion people or the district assembly or whichever?
All right, so that was our MTN video report for this afternoon. Now, you can also send your video report via WhatsApp number 551 433 and we'll get to see yours as well. Let's take a quick breather. We'll be right back with more news after this. Stay with us. And in entertainment this afternoon, for three decades and counting, they blessed the music scene with their anointed voices and inspirational lyrics. What really keeps them going, and especially in an oversaturated industry? Evergreen music duo and twin group Tago Sisters have been speaking to TV3 Entertainment. And come on, T -T. And come on, say. Comprising Lydia, Dede Yosin Tego, and Elizabeth Kokoi Tego, Gospel Music Group was formed in the early 80s. The acclaimed gospel brand recorded their debut album titled Nyami Ekesi back in 1987. At that time, you see, there, there was a, a lot of um, uh, chaos in the house. My mom and my siblings were not agree with what we are doing. But one day they called a meeting and then there was a whole lot of um, confusion in the house. And Kaka raised her hand. He said, Mommy, can I say something? My, my, and all my siblings were there, got it. Kakra, we what did you say? <laughs> I said to my mom, Mommy, I know what we have is just by God's grace and it's a gift of God and we want to develop it and then do it for him. And everybody was like, Yare, we yare, madam, because they believe that music is nothing. It's been over three decades of inspiring generations with their spirit-filled songs, and the Tego sisters have not looked back. Along the line came mega major hits, which further endeared Tego sisters to Ghanaians. An exciting year so far for the award-winning group. Tego sisters have crisscrossed the length and breadth of Ghana and beyond, spreading the gospel through I their music. I contact with uh, Francis, uh, Reverend Francis Kusiamwa Kulate, okay. and we travelled. Uh, we travelled to London. Okay. That is our first album, Nyami Ekesi. Okay. And when we came to Ghana, Nyami Ekesi was a bomb. Wow. Yeah. And no, no payola. No payola. Oh, that's a no payola. Mm. No payola at all. I mean, when I'm coming, like if I, if I know you, you are playing my song, right. traveling outside, coming back to Ghana, I buy you a nice shirt and your tie. Mm. When you wear them, you remember me. When I give you money, you finish eating it. You won't even remember that I give you money. That's, true. that's what we've been doing. That's appreciated. The gifted duo have remained relevant even after 30 years in the music scenes. What keeps them going? Um, the word of God. And then prayer, and we have people that pray for us. Mm. So it's just by the grace of God that has brought us far. Oh, this oh, and see my son, no, oh, no, na oh, we, the Jamie. Indeed, memories flooding back there. But let's take a look at some international news.
Now, Kenyan opposition figure Miguna Miguna says he was beaten and drugged before being forcibly removed from the country for a second time. The deportation came hours after a court held top officials in contempt for failing to release him from the airport where he was being held. On to some other stories from the international front. Nobel Peace Prize winner Malala Yousafzai has returned to Pakistan for the first time since being shot by Taliban militants. Ms. Yousafzai, now aged 20, and a vocal human rights activist, was shot in the head by a gunman for campaigning for female education in 2012. Soon after arriving, she met Prime Minister Shahid Khan Abbasi. Details of the trip have been kept secret in view of sensitivity. The trip is expected to last four days, and she arrived with officials from the Malala Fund group. At just 11, Ms. Yousafzai began writing an anonymous diary for BBC Urdu about her life under Taliban rule. She later became a vocal advocate of female education amid militant suppression in Pakistan and was deliberately attacked on a school bus at the age of 15. Malala's story brought international attention. The Pakistani Taliban said at the time that they shot her because she was pro-West and promoting Western culture in Pashtun areas. A fire at a police station in the Venezuelan city of Valencia in Carabo state has left 68 people dead. Government officials say the blaze reportedly started after prisoners set fire to mattresses in an attempt to break out on Wednesday. Police used tear gas to disperse relatives who surrounded the station after news of the fire broke. Chief State Prosecutor Tariq Saab said an investigation into what had happened would begin immediately. Theresa May has pledged to keep the UK strong and united after Brexit as it marks a year to go until the UK's departure from the European Union. The Prime Minister is to visit England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland appealing to those for and against Brexit. There are just months left to strike a deal on the future UK-EU relationship. Former Prime Minister Tony Blair said it was more likely than a few months ago that Brexit could be stopped, saying it was not too late. Blair, a strong backer of UK membership of the EU, told BBC Radio Force today the sensible option was to take a final decision once the terms of the deal have been set out. And that's it for Midday Live here on TV3. My name is Solis Rose Okwate. We've been live on DSTV channel 279 with live updates on our various social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, as well as Instagram. Don't forget to tune in to our other bulletins for more news updates and also visit 3news.com. Good afternoon.